Namaste and in La Ketch, and welcome to this week's edition of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and as always, I'm going to reflect on Namaste and in La Ketch in this way. Namaste comes from the Sanskrit spoken, it's the Brahmi, and it means the divine in me recognizes the divine in you. And in La Ketch comes from the other side of the world, from the Mayan culture, and it simply means I am another you. And we're talking about creating a, a new world or a new normal. Imagine what that kind of greeting when you meet another on the street, even a stranger, and you have that attitude in your mind, what difference that can make on an individual level first. And then it spreads out to everybody else. What a wonderful world that would be, eh? Cool. All right. So this week's guest is Dr. Pat Ballone. And her um, forte is as a coach and a health strategist. She's written a best-selling book called Why Are You Sick, Fat, and Tired? And she speaks to a lot of different things about health. She's a certified functional medicine practitioner. Uh, she's a doctor of chiropractic. She's also a first-line therapy practitioner. And she has a master's in oriental medicine. So this is going to be a wonderful conversation. Welcome, Pat. Thank you. I love being here. I really appreciate the invite and spending time with you like today. This is perfect. Cool. Cool. So we're going to ask Dr. Pat, as your uh, website denotes, and, and the information about you will be in the description as well. So in the, the beginning of how you discovered your interest and your curiosity and, and your connectivity to health and a vibrant lifestyle, how did that first become present in your awareness well it goes back to being a child you know and the you know I, i've always had um i've always gravitated towards eating really well i never liked candy you know i never liked sugar so when i grew up you know people still uh, almost are horrified when i eat raw rhubarb you know, I just peel it and I eat it. I remember that as a kid, you know, a hand, handful of salt, raw rhubarb, and man, that, that was it. That was wonderful. I mean, I, I no. love that. And the other thing is, is that, you know, I ate a lot of tomatoes growing up and um, I ate a lot of vegetables. Like I wanted to be like Popeye. You know, that's a fruit. The tomatoes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it, it's the reason because it has seeds inside. But the... Um, but also, you know, like the things like spinach, I ate spinach, I love spinach, I, you know, and whenever we had it, you know, I always, you know, would sing that, you know, and down to the finish, I eat my spinach, you know, because I'm Popeye by the Sailor Man, and I always wanted to be strong, and I was, grew up in a neighborhood of all boys, so I didn't have very much choice of like, Barbie or have a life playing baseball or football. The guys were more like, let's have a ham hamburger on Tuesday, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, or like, you know, greasy grimy gopher guts. I mean, that, that, you know, it's just like, I can remember like going on a hunt for pollywogs and worms, you know, and my mother asked me, what did you do, you know, when you're at school on break today? And I said, oh, we went, we found pollywogs and we found, you know, and um, worms because we're going to go fishing on Saturday. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's so fortunate to be able to do that as kids. I grew up with a uh, uh, woods about a third of a mile away from the house and I'd spend entire days there by myself just wandering around and, and playing and enjoying and, and uh, it just you know kids don't have that opportunity today it seems. Mm -hmm. No they don't I mean they, they're very structured you know it's just like they're I went with a friend of mine the other day to go pick her son up who's uh, in uh, first grade and um it was like a 20 minute lineup of cars, you know, picking their kids up. There wasn't even a school bus. People don't pick, like, people don't dump their kids on school buses. I see them, but I don't see them in operation that much. And I was just surprised. I said, so, you know, and, and then there's somebody who checks the kid off as soon as they get in your car. And I just like, wow, there's just like, where, I mean, like, you know, the days of growing up, you know, and, and then when you're living in, you know, my mentors never lock their house ever. It became mm -hmm. a problem when they wanted to sell a place because then there was a lockbox on it. And then they had to figure out what the code for the lockbox was. 
you know, and that just never really worked for me. And I, I grew up in that mentality. And so anytime that we had, um, you know, the, it, you know, it's just like, you just walk into someone's house, you know, kids just don't have that ability to do that. You know, mm -hmm. and my aunt, my aunt had something like 12 kids or something like that. So when you ate at her house, whatever went by you never went by you again. So like the green beans, there were some more green beans by the time it got to the beginning. They say, right. can I have some more? No. And you always were mindful about everybody having some, mm -hmm. you know, so you, and so you didn't have to be told like, you know, stop being, you know, like a, a hog, you know, and, and like hogging all those mashed potatoes, you know, or whatever it was, you know, pass it, you like, you know, take some for yourself and pass it down. So you never really had like big helpings of things when I grew up on a plate. So there was never that issue of, you know, like, oh, what are, what's the size portion for that? <laughs> you know, just have a couple more kids and make the same amount of food and it has to go farther. <laughs> right, right, right. And, you know, you, you're talking about the, the ability of uh, knowing your neighbor and, and being free and having the open doors and, you know, in urban areas today, which is where I live now, um, you know, there's walled communities and you don't know your neighbor. Growing up, there were no fences, no walls. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the addition uh, in town pretty much knew each other. Of course, I grew up in a really small community. But moving uh, to the larger urban area, it was like, wow, there's, you know, there's really no community here, or at least it seemed like it. And so there's these, you know, developments of the smaller communities that don't necessarily have anything to do with the local community. It's where mm -hmm. people choose to gather that are of like mind and, and so forth. But so the, that at least had the opportunity to happen. Mm -hmm. So in that discovery of, uh, or at least the experience of not having the, the large portions and things like that, I would imagine that probably trickled out into the rest of your life and, and really not requiring those. Well, you know, there's some things that, you know, I have like no turning point for like, not like when I eat them, <laughs> you know, like I love tzatziki, you know, which is that yogurt and mm -hmm. cucumber and onion. The gyro sauce. Oh, I love that. It, it's yeah. just like, it's so good, but I use it on a lot of different things. So I don't eat the whole bucket <laughs> in, in one sitting. And I also don't buy big portions to begin with. Um, you know, so I have, you know, you have rotating foods you know, because foods have a tendency, you know, I noticed uh, it seems like they don't um, have a sustainability of lasting long, like just pick fresh and on your table. You only really get that if you're buying from a farmer's market. So mm -hmm. if you're buying from some place like Trader Joe's or even Whole Foods Market, you know, you have to take a look at, well, how long does that box of lettuce, you know, that lettuce mix really last? Right. You know? And, you know, and I you know, have a really great tip and how to make it last a little bit longer, you know, so it still stays fresh and dry, you know, and you just wrap paper towels, you take it out, you take it out, of, put a paper towel over it and wrap it around and put it back in. And it helps it, you know, retain um, its freshness for at least about four or five more days. Mm -hmm. if, you take, if you're one person going through, uh, you know, a four or five pound box of lettuce, that's like that. Sure. And, and, you know, there's a lot of water in that. And so th that's usually what promotes the, the decay, I think, is that yeah. water oozing out and, and not being absorbed by something well, or staying in a dry area. Is that part well, of it? It's also the not having any air. <laughs> a lot of those boxes are sealed, right? right? And so when you don't have the circulation of air, you have that, that water that goes someplace and just sits there. And then that, that's a problem with, with food not being preserved very well or being on its own. Sure. So uh, moving on into your life, what, uh, what got you interested in the, the oriental medicine and, and chiropractic? Because those two kind of go together, even though we may not think so, or at least Westerners don't, because we don't really understand Oriental or, or Chinese medicine, and let alone chiropractic, even though there's <laughs> the, the markets proliferated with them now. Yes. The, well, you know, the, the, a couple of things that happened is, is that um, I went to, when I went to school, I had all the prerequisites for pre-med and I worked at the University of Michigan Hospital for my independent study. So I didn't have to get paid. But what I did there is I got to talk to a lot of people when they first came into the hospital, like when the first day, like, hey, my name's Patricia, 
you know, I'm a patient relations advocate doing an independent study. And can you tell me, is there anything I can do for you so that, you know, did you forget something like toothpaste, toothbrush, whatever it is, I'll make sure that you get it before the end of today. And that's what I did for, to get an A in some class. And, but what I noticed when I was in the hospital is that I kept on thinking, this is not the place for anybody to get healthy. And when I finished that stint, you know, I always say that I got fired because I told somebody that I ran into in the chemotherapy ward, the cancer ward, that if it was me, because they he, this guy came up to me very forlorn saying, I only have six weeks to live. And I said, did I ever meet you before? And he goes, I don't think so, but we'll never see each other again. <laughs> and so, it, it, and he had kind of had a little bit of a sense of humor. And he said, I don't know what to do. And I said, well, why would you stay here? This is the most ugliest place I've ever been in my life. And you're not going to get help. You know, you're not going to get healthy here. And if I was going to, if that was a delivery to me, I would go out and do something, whatever it is my heart desired that I've always wanted to do and never had the opportunity sure, to do. Sure, why waste your right. time being somewhere that you're miserable yeah. if you if yeah, you've accepted sure. and, and you're in a belief of that you've got X number of days to live. Yeah. Right? It's and, like, well, it also could change your mind by the time you get outside, you know, and Absolutely. You that motivation to, you know, to say, you know, cause like, you know, they tell people all the time that you've got this and they say, see you later. And then, then like five years later, that person's soul or your animal is still walking around because they took a different venue of way to go get beyond that. Well, and this is where, you know, a lot of folks and in, in, it seems like most of the folks that I have conversations with that we come to a, a place of recognize it's all about, your attention, intention, and interaction, mm -hmm. and where you place that focus and how disciplined you are with it is how life will reflect to you. And it's that inner and outer um, dance that mm -hmm. can, you know, you find new dance tunes, right? Instead right. of the, the old gloomy woe is me kind of country and western stuff right and whether you lose everything right. <laughs> in my ear right, over right. Losing you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And, and so then that flips to hey i'm going to enjoy life i'm going to listen and pay attention and, and enjoy people around me and figure out a different way that i can enjoy whatever time i have left and and oftentimes that's extended because of that attitude well, Norman Cousin did that. Remember in his book, The Anatomy of a, an Illness, I think it was called, you know, he went out and he bought, um, you know, Ellen Alda type movies or Candid Camera um, movies. And he came home and he said he decided if he was going to be sick and might die, then he's going to laugh. Right. Um, you know, and so it's what, the happened best medicine. Was, what it happened was is that he got healed. You know, and just from doing, you know, paying attention to his food, making that mindful change about that, making some lifestyle choices that, you know, to give up something um, that is killing him. And, you know, and he decided to laugh. He watched every movie that he possibly, that was funny, you know, and he mm -hmm. decided he was going to laugh out loud. So his books, it's an old book. So it was like maybe like 20 or 30 years ago that that book was written. It. But, you know, we forget to laugh. Even yeah. like, you know, and, and when we, when we think things are not funny, that's going on, like, we, like, it, it's hard to find sometimes that bit of humor that, you know, can just make you, you know, that sure. laugh out well, loud. You know, somebody mentioned that there's this seesaw that we're in between all the neurochemicals that cause constriction mm -hmm. and the chemicals that cause the openness and the, the vulnerability, if you will. And laughter gives you it causes your brain to secrete those happy chemicals yeah. that happy chemicals <laughs> yeah well it, it, um oxytocin and, and mm -hmm. all of those kinds of stuff and it, it brings you to a completely different place and and oftentimes imbues life with a sense of awe mm -hmm. right and just That's that true. place of you know it, it, and as i had said that word you probably went to you know, that place where there's a sense of awe. And oh. when we have that, life becomes much different. Well, if you did word association on that one, I would tell you hug a tree. <laughs> you know, and, and I had people go out of my office, you know, there um, when I had it on Cape Cod years ago. And, you know, there was a tree outside. And I said, that tree has been hugged by a lot of people. 
um, when I was there for the 10 years I was in that location. Uh -huh. um, and I would just say, don't forget to hug the tree on the way going out. And he go, Dr. Pat, what if someone's watching? And I said, who cares? <laughs> I, go, Does it, I go, isn't it fun? I said, it's living. You know, when you hug it and you share that energy field with it, then, you know, I said, you're both in, you know, you're, it's uplifting experience. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you, you mentioned something a bit ago, you know, I always think about it being external and internal and who's the vehicle. So when you do that external talk that you hear, that's always going around you. And then you have that internal talk that's going on around you. And then if you, all of a sudden you realize that it's just talk outside and inside it's your, your um, sometimes majority of the time it's your um, lizard brain <laughs> doing this thing, your primitive brain, mm -hmm. you know, and when you realize that you're the vehicle, it's like a rocket ship taking off because whatever the garbage is in those conversations outside, inside are going on, then you can make sense of it finally. And then you can move forward in a very simpler, faster way and get unstuck and just be present in the moment and then look for other solutions. And then they're easier to welcome in. A lot of times you're thinking like, oh, I never can find anything of what I'm looking for. Like if you have to do a search on Google and then I was like, well, what, what are you looking for? And I'd look it up. I go, well, here it is. It's right here and here. And they go, how come you didn't find it? And I can't, I go, I don't know. <laughs> I, just, I just go with the, like, those are the words that you gave me so if we learn key words for our system that we can always go in and tag and get the energy from you know it's just like what's your superpower you know don't know what your superpower is ask your four best friends or if you have four best friends or even just one you know if you had to tell me what my superpower what is it you know and it's just like people say you know, like i've i'm loaded with common sense i have a lot of common sense you know it's making sense common that's the difficult challenge, right? <laughs> for sure for sure <clears throat> you know? and and being able to like see the end of the tunnel i can see the end before i even start a lot of times and so mm -hmm. i always you know i work off my um my einstein time theory from like, okay, so I have to be done by six o'clock. Here's my list of stuff I have to do. And um, and then I will just clock my time off and turn my telephone off. And I just do it. A lot of times I'm done way before then. Sure. And I'm thinking sure. like, well, what am I going to do now? Right. <laughs> right. And, and time, you know, especially it, it, it's not necessarily um, clockwise. It's, um, and I've heard this before, it's a measurement of the change of entropy. And so when you don't have the entropy going on, you get a lot of, lot more stuff done quicker. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, one of the other things that I've heard that kind of correlates to what you're saying is that we live half inside and half outside. And what you've stated already is that when you become aware of those trigger words that send you down the wrong road and you, you figure out what the other keywords are that send you down the better path, then you become aware more of what's going on inside. And we don't always consider that, you know, it's just a rampant uh, flood of thoughts and emotions and things that we encounter during the day that we think we don't have control over. For sure. And, you know, the mammalian brain is it's unconscious. It's dominant and it's unconscious. And the thing about the mammalian brain, that's a very cool thing. I was talking about this to somebody earlier this morning on a call. And um, I said, you know, there, remember that movie, Love Actually? Everyone loves that movie, Love Actually. It starts out with Hugh Grant, you know, saying these specific words about love. You know, love is everywhere. I don't ever see or remember people coming through Heathrow Airport when they're meeting their family and their friends thinking that they hate each other. You don't see that. Right. So it's just like, and so when you see that movie, that anchors that mammalian um, memory of that movie to a certain emotion. So it's just like love actually. So it's just like when you go away from that movie, anything that happens in that movie, because it's such an anchoring aspect of it, is for you know everything that you do. So people have those movies that all of a sudden they start crying. It's not because the movie makes them cry. It's because your memory is tied with that emotion of what's happening that you're actually visualizing. You know, right. it, it's like, it's such a, you know, like the Holy Grail 
of really like, if you really want to have a positive life, then, you know, I can teach you how to get, how to keep that. So the mammalian brain is triggering off all those good things and you're tying all those good things that are happening around you now and anchoring them even deeper. So you don't have to have the bad things or if something the bad that happens, she's going, okay, what did I learn from it? Time to move on. You know, and it's not something that you internalize or take on like you got to own it. Right. <laughs> And today we're in the process of moving out of the last century thinking, which was mostly based on self-deprecation because mm -hmm. that's what we were programmed to be less than, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're always seeing ourselves from that perspective. And yet with guys like Tom Campbell and Bruce Lipton, mm -hmm. and even uh, I mentioned Melissa Hughes earlier, you know, they're saying, hey, wait a minute we do have charge of how we think and feel. It's just a discipline that we don't engage in order to be able to do so. And so that would indicate, well, maybe we're a bit too lazy still or apathetic and or unwilling. Um, I always say it's, you know, people always want the magic pill. They want to get it done yesterday. Book enlightenment. Um, you know, and, you know, there's no process that does not take time. Right. And the thing is, is they always put the cart before the horse, you know, and thinking that they're going to get someplace, but they don't because every, there's no magic pill and everything takes time. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that when people actually sometimes get the cart in front of the horse and they're going, but I got the cart and I got the horse in the, in the right position, but still nothing's happening. Well, the thing that's not happening is you got to attach the cart to the horse and you got to get in the driver's seat and you got to take control of it, you know, or else it doesn't happen. You know, right. I talk about that in my class that I teach called Be Stronger Than Medicine. I talk about that mindset, you know, piece, almost every one of the classes that I talk about, because I always say, you got to go back to basics. You got to know your bottom line and you got to stop putting the cart before the horse and you got to attach it and you got to get in the driver's seat and you got to drive it. It's simple. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you mentioned earlier that the, you know, what you've noticed is that you, for yourself, you're able to visualize the goal and be there and, and envision it, embody it even, or, or internalize it, which is the same practice that entrepreneurs and, and salespeople have taught for business people have taught for years, the successful ones that have said, hey, you know, start with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. And then back out the details and the steps and the things. And that's part of what I do with my transformational coaching that, and, and when you're too close to that, it's hard to step back and, and see what those individual steps are. So that's where the conversation is kind of like we're having because it, mm -hmm. it's, it's both empathic and generative, right? Mm -hmm. Where, where right. you recognize, yeah, we're on the same page. We feel the same things or at least similar things. So where can we go with this now? And then let's ask some cool questions and see where mm -hmm. our curiosity takes us with the knowledge that we've built so far. And maybe ask some questions that we don't, have answers to yet and then have an opportunity to at least explore the possibilities for sure i mean if there's you know there's um there's always great creativity in just conversation you know mm -hmm. and and so you know as in if you recognize sometimes when you're whatever when your creativity is the best you know for me i know some of my best you know, posts that I ever write are usually I'll wake up at like four o'clock in the morning and I'll look at the clock and it'll be 444. And I know that means something, but I look at the clock, it says 444 and I'll lay down and I'll think, well, I should, you know, it's like four, it's like five o'clock. That's one hour. Maybe I get up and go take a walk, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, you know, and then I'll see something in my head. Oh, I have that post that I can write on and I'll get the words that I need, the answers I need, the like in the order that I need them, you know, and I can put a draft out and get it done together before six o'clock in the morning and have breakfast and then go for my walk. Mm -hmm. But it's usually, it doesn't happen every day, but I wake up, you know, um, for years I wake, you know, when I had my practice and I was like on, you know, on my game and in my office and doing miracles. <laughs> That's what people tell you, like you're always doing miracles. I said, you can't do miracles alone. You got to have some, you got to have something to work with. Oh, right. Know? And and it's like, you know, I call it living in quantum entanglement with a unified field. We do it whether we're conscious or, or not of mm -hmm. it. Yep. But what these triggers are, the 444 or 1111 or 1221, a palindrome, series of numbers, this seems to be one of 
the most um, the numerous people who have experienced their own process of self-awareness and self-development will state that this is one of those things that they notice is the numbers that seems mm -hmm. to trigger, you know, the synchronicities that mm -hmm. tie everything together. And so, you know, when we think about it, well, you know, the universe is built on math and science. So why wouldn't numbers be involved at least whether we see it that way or not, but there's, there's this curiosity I have anyway of, of acknowledging these things and thinking, okay, well, why does that happen? Mm -hmm. you know, how, how can I understand that more to be more present with it and see what the deeper levels of that understanding might offer that enable me to be a better person and, and do more and, and, you know, experience greater happiness and joy in my life, which mm -hmm. is what it leads to. Right. Well, if you do that, then you can share it. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, you, you do, because a lot of people, you know, they're, they're so in their shell, you know, and they, they're so in their own car, and they're so, you know, it's just like, if we're going, driving in the same direction, why don't I just pick you up on right. the way going? No, 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 I might want to leave earlier, you know, well, that's true, so we can make an agreement, if you want to leave earlier, we'll just leave earlier. Right. It's, like, it's not a big deal. Well, know? that kind of reveals the, the nature that we have of, of holding cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. You know, two yeah. belief systems that are in opposition. Yeah, I want to go this way, and here's an opportunity that shows up. No, I can't do that because, right? <laughs> and, well, I love excuse when people give me an excuse I like I said so do you want me to solve that for you because I wake up every day thinking the world needs me and what problems can I solve today and so when I wake up you know I that the world needs me I'm thinking so something's going to happen today that I'm going to be able to make a difference in somebody which will be able to make a difference in two people which will be able to make a difference in four people and eight and so on and so on right. you know how all those numbers play out you know, and someone said to me um, after they saw me give a part of my class, they stopped in a colleague of mine that I've known for 40 years or something like that. Um, you know, uh, I asked him a question about something un totally unrelated. And he just said to me, you know, and I just said to myself, you know, uh, about five minutes before that, okay, affirmation, the world needs me, you know, so I'm showing up. And he said to me, your talk was so incredible. You know, Patricia, what you're doing, he goes, is so needed by the whole world. He, and he put in bold, the world needs you now. I'm going, wow, it was just so amazing. And it was just like, could somebody just send it to me once a day, please? <laughs> you, right. know, you know, it, it, was, a, it was a great um, acknowledgement. And, uh, and I really appreciate that because it's just, it's, you know, then, then your energy, right? Because if you're in a good mood, people always know how things like kind of just like fall into place. They're on their game. They're in their groove. They're in the vertex, whatever they want to call it. You know, it's just like when you like that, it's like, wouldn't it be great to be able to create that to be your superpower, mm -hmm. you know, to be in your groove, you know, and on your game, you know, like, like sure. a good majority of the time. That would be really great. I you know? think that's possible. You know, I, I had never thought about my superpower and I was interviewed uh, it was a year or so ago, and they asked the question, what's your superpower? Superpower. Without hesitation, vulnerability came out. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, I didn't even have to think about it. It was just there. And I, afterwards, I'm thinking, wow. You know, because that's really, to be vulnerable to those things around you, there's a certain sense of, of faith, love, and trust mm -hmm. that go along with that. And kind of an anticipation of better things mm -hmm. in store. And then you begin to realize that as you just did with your thinking about what you hope to have and then having your colleague reflect that back to you, that's an example of just how connected our thoughts and feelings and, and things are and, and how we can feel each other in that way. You know, the, the mm -hmm. confidence exudes and you recognize that kind of person in the room before you notice anybody else, usually. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. And it's just like you have, you know, you connect to your eyes. Like when I talk about, um, you know, uh, in my mindset portion of my course, Be Stronger Than Medicine, I always talk about um, the eyes. Um, I had this really lovely gentleman who's from your area, actually. Um, his name is Alan 
Friedman. I don't know if you know him or not, but Alan. Not yet. Um, but you should, because Alan said, you know, I, I was on a podcast of his and um, it, it's just like, we just so connected from the get-go that it was just came out perfect. It was, I couldn't have asked for a better podcast other than this one. <laughs> and this is really great because I really like our, like how we think and, and can feed off of that. But what he said to me at the very end, he goes, Dr. Pat, just remember eye to eye, heart to heart. And so I always, like, you know, I didn't even, never had to write that down to remember it, you know, and um, it's like eye to eye, heart to heart. And so what I taught in my class was that, you know, I told the story about Geronimo and the guy who wanted to interview him, right? And I said at the very end, because Geronimo wouldn't talk to him at the very end, and, and he was told that if, if Geronimo wants to speak with you, because he kept on not granting anybody access to his, to have an interview with him, then he will ask you a question, you know? And so this guy sat there and he kept on staring in his eyes and he started crying and he couldn't figure out why he was crying. He kept on staring in his eyes and then he started seeing Geronimo's whole life, all the struggles, all his successes and what he was struggling with right now. And so, you know, and when Geronimo said, okay, I'll talk to you. And he just said, the guy said, I don't need to, I don't need to ask you anything. And he went out and he wrote this, his wonderful story about him. But the thing about him was, is that um, when I told that story, you know, it's always slightly teary eyed for me. Because I think that I've done that, that emotional, that mammalian brain, I've done that with other people. And so it always holds a big emotion because you're not just connecting heart to heart and eye to eye. It's like the heart houses the mind and the mind houses the soul. So if you take and look in someone's eyes, you get to look into their heart in their soul. Mm -hmm. And I always give that out as a class assignment to do, a homework assignment to do, to do with yourself. Yeah, it, it's, we I call it soul gazing. Yeah, and so, and okay. you can sit with, yeah. with people, look into their eyes and, and with vulnerability, because that's a place you have to be in, open, yep. you know, no uh, constrictions mind. whatsoever. And, and that's a challenge in itself. And, and in the process of getting to that, you'll actually feel or sense your body go through different phases of that recognition until you get to that place. And tears oftentimes are some of the things that show up because mm -hmm. you feel that connectedness and, and okay. you, you connect with the other person. Mm -hmm. Now, on a uh, somewhat practical level, how would you suggest for those who or at least, you know, curious of extending themselves, of becoming more, of um, realizing a greater dream in their lives. Oh. What would be some of the, the things that you could offer as, you know, practical beginnings to do so? Well, one of the things I always ask people is if they're willing to do what it takes to be healthy. And then the other thing I ask them is, what's their dream day? You know, and I have people who struggle with just coming up with a few things, you know, and, and I always like it when someone comes up with like, well, you know, I'm just hoping my husband gets a better job. Well, I'm not talking about him. I'm talking about you. It's mm -hmm. coming, bringing it back home about, you know, about you know, like, what does your day look like from the moment that you get up? If you didn't have to worry about kids you know, your husband, your job or anything. What does that look like? And if you give me your dream day, I can figure out how you can manifest it. So it's just like you just, you take the pieces of the puzzle and you go, okay, so these components for this, in order for this to happen, A, you got to have your health because you cannot have your health. You cannot expect to do a dream day and not have your health. It doesn't right. work. They go hand in hand. And so if you can do that, then you can pick, pick the pieces of the puzzle together, whether it has to be like in the diet and, you know, good nutrition, you know, proper exercise, proper sleep, that mindset, positive mental attitude, and then the structure, biomechanics, posture, function, that whole pace. Because when we don't have structure, then we eventually lose function. If we don't have function, then the nerves are involved in that end up deteriorating and so does the organ system that they're connected to yeah. uh, you know and then you got to go back and have a tremendous amount of respect for the brain 
as the brain controls and coordinates all those functions. So if you can dream your dream day, all you got to figure out, okay, so where is it that is my weakest link? And then figure out how to fortify that weakest link, you know, so that that can be satisfied. And then, you know, take that weakest link, you know, and then make it your best link ever. You know? mm -hmm. so then, you're, then you have balance, you know, and harmony um, in your work, home, and all your life. You right. know, it's just like, and, and then, you know, when stuff happens, you just kind of like, well, okay, you know, there's someone cut me off, you know, I'm going to get upset about it. I don't think so. Yeah. You know, and it's just like, there's nothing like I've recently, you know, in the last couple of years, you know, um, and everyone has said this to me, I had a woman back into my car and when I went out and looked at it, she said, she goes, you're not mad. And I said, I go, well, there's, that's why you have insurance. And I said, and there's nothing to get mad at. You made a mistake and you backed into a car. It was an accident. Yeah, I, I knew, yes, go, you, you need to fix it. So it was like it was before the accident, you know? And my cousin, God love him, you know, he was talking to me, we we're in his car. We're gonna, he insisted on driving to go grocery shopping. And I said, no, 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 I'll drive, I'll drive. I said, you should let me do when I want to do, when I want to do it. I always said it to him. And he back, took out my driver's side door and the pass and the other, the, the both doors on that one side of a, like an SUV, those are expensive. And so, and he said the same thing as, well, you're not even mad. And I said, what did I be mad? That's not something to get mad about. You know, in my inconvenience, I go, I'm sure you're not gonna let me be too inconvenienced, you know, but the, but the thing is like, you can't- And that may have held you up for something else to happen that there was some timing involved that you needed to be slowed down a little bit. Yeah, it saved putting miles on my lease car. <laughs> <So> <laughs> they got me a different car. I go, I'm not driving the car that they gave me. I can guarantee you that. And um, but the because I was driving a lot that summer. I was going back from Virginia, back to Massachusetts and New York, you know. And so I was on the road a lot for about sure. a month. Sure. And you mentioned I, Geronimo earlier, though. I, I oh, yeah, I like this the one. because I think there's one one more element. Speaking of the indigenous traditions, that we often miss in, in this brain heart combination, you know, the longest journeys here to here, 18 inches, right? We all know that one, but the gut, the intuition, the, the, where we sense things first. And this is what the indigenous philosophy calls the first brain. So, you know, it's where we can feel whether it's desirable or undesirable. And then we process mm -hmm. it in the heart and, and offer it to the brain to make better choices about where we go and, and in creating that the vision of the perfect day right so there you've got your vision you got your goal and you break it down and, and as you're moving through it you can sense whether oh this is desirable or this is undesirable and there's subtle impressions that we don't often pay attention to we call it you know we second guess ourselves a lot mm -hmm. and that Absolutely. first impression that's most important and that we usually pay attention to because we think we know better instead of allowing the sense to come about. Because we can't think our way through a system built on vibration, which is what reality is. And quantum physics has shown that now, and it, it's acceptable. So how do we do that? Well, we reverse the order, right? We don't think first and try and shove it through the body. We feel first and then bring it up through the head and make better choices about it. Mm -hmm. Right? right. Uh, and so, and this is, you know, it's the same thing that you're doing is looking at, okay, where do we want to go? How's it feel? And, and what are the differences in where we can take ourselves by how we think and feel? Mm -hmm. Well, that mindset shift and getting all the lizard brain stuff out of the way, the primitive brain stuff that keeps you, you know, like stuck, you know, it, it, and, and that thinking mode too, because, you know, when you're trying to take those one step, two steps forward, the lizard brain is going to go on. You've never been there before. Got to, it's dangerous. You got to yeah. watch out. You know, and like, you know, those people with blonde hair, you know, from that part of the world, you know, they're, they're known to blah, blah, blah. And like, you know, it's like, wherever you heard that one at. And so it just keep, keeps on bringing up that trail of information. Well, it's know. not only in the lizard brain, it's also yeah. genetically programmed from the cultural memes that are embedded because mm -hmm. it, it flows through the lineage. And, then, and that's the other thing that comes up that we don't necessarily recognize is that we're fully operational. Our minds, our brains, our DNA, you know, we don't have any junk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we just haven't realized how to pay attention well enough, yeah. and which brings in the intention, 
right? And then yeah. how we shift the interaction to where we turn that challenge into change. And, and what's, what's funny is that challenge and change only have three letters difference, the LLE. And so, you know, these are personal liabilities, limitations, and excuses that we offer ourselves as to why we can't do something. And I'm saying, you know, it's bury the words, if can't and impossible, have a ceremony for them, just get rid of them. <laughs> well, you know, I have a post that I put out that I take off the, you know, the, you know, change those same words so that they're more productive and, and positive, you know, but they, a lot of people, you know, uh, when, when talking to people about what I do and working with people, I always ask them, you know, I can feel when, you know, someone's on a fence, you can feel that, right? You know, so when someone went, I don't know, let me think about it, you know, right. and um, they say, well, if you ask anybody that you like, and because you're looking for a like mind to support your decision of moving ahead or not moving ahead. But I always ask, I said, so where does the decision making process lie for you? Like, what is it that has you blocked? You know, where does it come from? You know, and, you know, when I think when we were originally speaking, I was telling you that, you know, like I was uh, talking to a woman who has some issues with her partner. And when we worked through what the issues with her partner was, like, you know, she digested her food better, she didn't have pain. But the thing was, is that when I asked her a really specific question, I said, so, well, tell me, how old is he now? And then I said, well, when you hit a roadblock with him, you know, I said, he stops listening to you. So if you don't speak in a language that he understands, then it's just going to sound like wah, 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 wah. And you that know? is such right. a key point, you know, as an educator, facilitator, speaker, and, and you know this as well, you really have to know your audience first because you have to speak the language that they're willing to listen to before you can take them anywhere, you have to get in touch with it. You have to have that empathic connection. Well, that conversation that I have with people for that actually is pretty much, because it, it's individualized per person, but sure. that pretty much sets them free because I get comments back from them going like, wow, it's the first time I felt this good in 17 years. Well, what happens, I'm always curious, whatever the number is, well, what happened? This particular person, she goes, well, that's when I got married. And I said, let's go, well, that should tell you a lot, you know, in and of itself. And then also gave her tools to like, you know, like then this is how I have to go and I have to communicate, you know, and just because everyone listens, everyone learns and everyone feels at a different space, you know? So, you know, I always love that, those breakthroughs that those aha moments, like, oh, you know, it's just like, and how much energy we use, you know, that we could be using someplace else that would benefit us a lot better. Precisely. You know so, right. And, and so, you know, I always ask, it's like, is there something I can do about this? No, if there's not, then, you know, I'll either go to sleep if it's at night, <laughs> you know, and I want to go to sleep, you know, or I'll get up and I'll, and I'll fix it. Whatever it is I have to do in order to like get or jot down something, whatever it is I need to do in order to get unstuck. Mm-hmm. And at least you're, you've shifted your attention to a direction that is more applicable to a solution mm -hmm. or to a resolution. And one of the things I've noticed is that having those uncomfortable conversations, right, mm -hmm. where you feel the tension with each other and you, you know it's there, you want to talk. You don't know how to start and you're afraid of rejection, mm -hmm. right? And yet, when you step outside of that fear, because you do love the other person or you wouldn't be with them, right? Mm -hmm. you, you may think that there are some issues, but the, the issues aren't about love. They're about the conditions you've placed on the love. Mm -hmm. And when you're in a place of unconditional love towards the other, then you can feel a little more vulnerable and saying, hey, you know, I'm not feeling too good about this. When I said this and, and you responded like this, it really made me feel, uh, you know, and, and I don't want to do that because I, I know that you love me and I love you. And, and, and so there's this reframing and uh, almost the, the return to that foundation of faith, love, and trust that you started with in the beginning of the relationship. Mm-hmm. 
Yep, for sure. And then because it's all about reality, you know, affinity and communication. So somewhere along the line, when there is that, you know, the in Scientology, they say when there's a I, I remember that triangle. Exactly. That's where it comes from. Yeah. In ARC. So it's just like, if you know, it's just like, well, I like this person, you know, so we're just not on the same page. We don't have the same reality. So how do we get on the same reality page again? You got to communicate, you know, and so you got to be willing to communicate and have that conversation and frame it so that someone can hear you as opposed to immediately shutting down. Right. You know, and you're so going to not make, I mean, you, let me reframe that. You're going to feel uncomfortable in that process. You and I both can agree and witness that when you do that, a heart space opens up and you can feel the tension leave the situation because now you've recentered and you've realigned with the other person at least to some degree and it may not resolve everything in that moment the conversation has still begun and so it makes it easier to continue it mm -hmm. for sure for sure it's not it's a we up we make things so difficult <laughs> for ourselves. Again, you know, it's our own choices, right? Well, like, like some people, I always say, I, you know, one of the, the niche, like my niche that I really like working with, I like working with women, especially women who can't get out of their own way. You know, as I like, I was like, wow, God, I've never thought about that argument about that. <laughs> and, you know, and it's reframing things so that, you know, you, you can get unstuck because when we hold all that bad or that energy in and we don't know what to do with it, it turns into being sick, mm -hmm. you know, and you don't want, you know, you, you want to like take that energy that turns you into being sick and let it go. Right. It's right. not going to serve you for your highest purpose anywhere, anytime soon in this lifetime going down the road. So there's a lot of things that people, there's a technique in chiropractic called NET and it's called neuroemotional uh, technique. And what you do is you go back to a specific, like where's that weak organ? Is there an emotion that's stuck with that weak organ on this person? And then you go figure out if it's time, energy, space, or a thing. And, um, you know, and I, and even like, sometimes I always call it the woo stuff going into like a past lifetime, you know, or whatever, just like, but you know, you take the charge off on it, you know, and then it's just like, and let that part of your body heal, you know, and it's just like, and stop doing things to ourselves that are, you know, that create more havoc and more sickness. And so, that, because you can't rely on the, you know, the sick model of medicine to save you because that's not going to ever happen. Oh, it and, hurts when I do that. Well, stop doing that. Right. <laughs> so like, like, why, why are you it's just like, okay, so when I go to pick something up, and I go, well, how do you pick stuff up? You know, they go, oh, I do it like this. They go, well, then don't ever do that again because you're picking things up wrong. How about picking it up and using this method? You know, can you do that? Yeah. It's just like, but I learned the other way. Unlearn it. Stop doing it. Or you'll see me forever. And I know that that would be a great thing to see yeah. me forever, but not for this reason. <laughs> yeah, I forget who it said, who was it that, that said it, but it, uh, both men and women need to unlearn the outer teachings, right, in order to find the inner teachings and, and what are, are there, because we've got all the answers. We just need to be curious and, and explorative enough to ask questions and be open to whatever answers come. They may not be the ones that we anticipate, but they'll be there. And like was um, uh, Maria Wilke, Rilke says that live with question. Don't expect to have answers right away because that, that's not the way the universe is built. You know, that you live the question and life will unfold the answer over time because it is a process. And, you know, we use the scientific method to, for repeatable results that are data-driven. Mm -hmm. We can use that same process for processes. Mm -hmm. right the repeatability of the activity that we have in the because the details are always different like you said the individuals are always uh, individuals right <laughs> we're not a unified whole yet well we're individuals in a whole and, and so and oftentimes we've dug that hole pretty deep um <laughs> to be able to to come out of that and relate to the process that got us out of it and then repeat that 
the mm-hmm. next time we experience it. And, and so we get more adept at, at doing so. And it sounds like that's what you're offering as far as a process with your clients too. It is. That's where, you know, um, you know, when the, you know, I always go back to the three brains, you just described the whole mammalian brain cycle, you know, and, um, and I love the, I love the data dump and I like the technical part of it. And you put it in such great, like simple English for me. Um, but, you know, it's just like when you, when you tie in with the emotions and you keep on tying with an emotion that doesn't work, or when someone talks about a bad experience they have, they keep on reliving that experience again and again and again every time they have that process. It's so much easier to create a new thought, actually, right. than it is to keep on talking about that same thing. Because in reality, in your brain, not only are you, or if you talk about something that you're afraid something's going to happen to you in the near future, and you explain it out in great detail, well, it's happened once. You talk, it, it happened twice. And then when you get there, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's going to happen. You mm-hmm. know, generally speaking, people right, live. Because you or, created the habit. So, yeah. So not only do you do it once, you've done it three times so far. So it's like, and then you have a habit and habits become rituals. You don't want those kind of habits to become rituals. You want to break that stuff. Absolutely. And, and being able to see it and shift it uh, gives you the opportunity to, to do so. Mm-hmm. The um, just being able to be aware of that um, opportunity mm-hmm. is yeah. what makes the difference. Now, speaking to that, how do you suggest to your uh, to yourself first of all, and and to others how to become more aware of the opportunities? Well, what I think you have to do, you know, when I'm looking at you know, I think of everything as being an opportunity. <laughs> so, you know, so that that's where, you know, I start my line in the sand. I look at everything as an opportunity. Then the question is, is it for me, against me, or not for me? And so, and is this the right time? Because you have to figure out if it's the right time. But you don't ask that question saying, like, it's the right time. Well, at 10 o'clock in the morning, I'm free. Well, no, is it the right time to even have it on your plate? You know, and... So it's just a lot of it is, you know, um, highly intuitive. And I think that when people are asking me, like, you know, for direction for doing that, you know, you have to go back to, like, what it is that you really want, you know, and see if it's congruent with your life. And does it create more balance or does it create more havoc for you to have that? Mm -hmm. And so if it creates more havoc, then I'm going to say it probably isn't the right time or it's not just for you. So I think all circumstances relate to either for you, against you, or not for you. And um, if it's not for you, it's okay. Just let go. Now, you don't have to own it. Exactly. And, and great advice. Just recognize it. Now, do you also notice that life and, and it seems to be full of patterns and cycles and rhythms and um, opportunities to take those same things to a new level every time they come around? For instance... Um, and, and I'm going to make it from a project manager standpoint, that having a lot of details, a lot of, of uh, for instance, um, parts that you're responsible for that all have different operations and different time frames and different schedules and all of that. And they all have their intrinsic challenges with them. Well, for each, when you're working with those over time, you begin to recognize the cycles and patterns of when things are going to happen. And this is true with events and organizations, things like that, when you're um, aware enough of them or you mm-hmm. begin clicking for them. So as those things come back around, it's like you you, you do one thing, you, you take it, whatever it is, to its next level to where it has to go through its own cycle again. And so you just let it go. And then another thing pops up and then another thing pops up and you, and you do these things. And all of a sudden it's like you're spinning plates, but all of those plates, when you begin to recognize, they all show up in their own perfect timing in flow. And you're able to manage all of them with much better efficacy because of that. Well, when you, it's like tr- it's anything that you do takes training. I mean, that you're going to have any repetition for. I mean, it's just like you have to train your, first off, you have to believe. Then you train your brain to like, you know, okay, so I've been there. I've done that. I know that when my car gets on this far from empty, I know that finding a gas station is not, um, you know, like I, I can do it in an hour from now if I'm driving. It's like I needed to do it like about an hour before then. 
Mm -hmm. So there's things that, you know, that you can do that take off the, the static, you know, that can make, you know, things go a lot smoother by taking care of the, um, what I call ancillary issues. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I should have done this before that. And, and that really doesn't matter okay. what, what's here right now. Right. And it's just like, you know, like, okay, you know, so, um, you know, it's like, and if you're paying attention to those like cycles, then some of those things, like, you know, when you're going down the steps, instead of going up and down the steps, up and down the steps 20 times, because you forgot this, or you forgot that, whatever, it might taste like, could be a collective mind going, okay, I'm going downstairs, I want to make this one count. So if I bring a bag, I can bring all my file folders with me downstairs once, you know, and I can set up, it will save me at least, you know, 30 minutes of going back and forth because I keep on forgetting things like make a list, you know, right. and then take that list and then, um, you know, record it, put it someplace, you know, tack it on a wall, whatever it is. Whatever you need to do to trigger whatever. your mind to remember. Right. And it's just like, you know, and because people always say, you know, they have these really miraculous minds. And I was telling a woman the other day, I said, well, you might have one at 44, but you're not going to have it at 60. I mean, you'll still have a great mind, but your ability to like take everything in and see it and, and not have it written down or paced out or your mind map for yourself. I said, you know, I, when you do that, you don't, you can create more space for something else. Mm -hmm. That's by far much more important than trying to keep all the stuff in your head. And if you learn to practice it earlier, I mean, I'm 64 now. I am, hot, I am more highly effective now than I ever have been in managing my time and getting things done. It, and it's just amazing. I've, to... always, I've always been like that. They, people yeah. used to, you know, like when I, sometimes if I'm, if I'm on somebody else's schedule, I'm thinking, oh my God, I go, it's like, this is taking so long to do this. I could do this literally in an hour. Right. It's taking this person three hours to do. And, you know, it's just like, you know, and it's just like, it depends upon your ability to focus and what your intention is and what your purpose. But you well, and that's where you can bring your bag along. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> when you have that downtime where you're doing something else, you can do uh, all kinds of other things in that time frame. There's a great book that uh, I was co-host for a small business talk show. I had a mentor who's 20 years my senior. It was just phenomenal. And one of the books that we talked about is Thank You for Being Late. And what that book was about was an entrepreneur where a client, he was supposed to meet with a client and they showed up late. Well, it gave him time to ruminate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and in that space, there was all kinds of other opportunities that were present for him to take advantage of simply because that person was late and he made use of the available time. Right. You know, it's just like when um, there's times that um, my business partner right now and I, when she goes to pick up her kids, you know, I just jump in the car with her to go pick the kids up and I bring my notebook for us, you know, with me. And then I go, well, this, this, here's the questions I have for you today, blah, blah, blah. And she's going, and she said, wow, she's, you know, and, and she goes, this is so more effective of the time. I mean, like you might use your time differently when you're there. Like you can do stuff on your telephone. I am not somebody who functions from my telephone. Right. Uh, people, yeah, I people, don't care for it either. People do it, but you know, I have a girlfriend who lives by that and she's always sending me something or like she, and I ask her for something. Can I have a link for that? Blah, blah, blah. She sends my phone. I go, where is it? I feel like I'm waiting for an email from you. <laughs> and, she, and she'll say, it's on, I, I, she goes, it's in Messenger. And I'm thinking like, I don't use Messenger. I mean, I, I use it for some purposes or some app. But it's use. funny how we assume that, and I think this is a, a, a mind set more than a mind flow. And that's, we believe that other people operate the same way we do. Mm -hmm. I had this conversation with my wife the other night because she works, she uses her phone for everything, business, and, and it's constantly... You know, she's got the electronic leash on all the time. I said, and she was concerned because some other folks weren't or had not had responded to her in, in the time that she thought that they should have. And I said, well, wait, sweetheart, you, you know, not everybody operates the way you do. You know, give them space. <laughs> you know that they're going to, you know, respond when they have time. And so there's this acquiescence to giving other people space and time to do what they need to, still knowing that they're going to show up and, and give you what you need 
but your impatience for that lessens, which opens up other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. for sure. You know, and like when something happens, I always think like, okay, so that happened, you know, all right. So what else is going on here? You know, I was going to a woman's meeting who's going to go, they're going to go climb some mountain around here. And so I thought it'd be a good opportunity to meet other people. And so I asked the person who invited me, you know, I said, well, I'll, I'll see you there. And, um, and so she said, she, I, I'm about, I'm just getting ready to make that right hand turn and um, to go over to there. And she said, the woman had to cancel it. She had an emergency. She said, I'm trying to, you know, been trying to get a hold of you. And I just said, okay. And she goes, um, where are you? I said, about 10 minutes from the location. And she goes, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to go there. <laughs> and I'm still going to see it. I'm only 10 minutes away. It isn't like, you know, go, why am I going to like change and alter my life? It's just like, I had planned to go to mm -hmm. do something in nature. So I'm going to go see what the nature looks like that's around there. Absolutely. And, and I, so I wasn't disappointed and I wasn't, you know, it's just like, well, I'll meet them next time. Just, okay. Yeah. Next. We'll, we'll, you know, but we'll everyone, but you're right. Everyone does some, I mean, like we all, you know, there is a conference, um, an international symposium that I was asked to be on. And I kept a friend of mine who asked me, who made that connection and who gave me the invite. I said, I haven't gotten anything from these people <laughs> at all. And he said to me, well, he goes, Pat, let me go find out, you know? And so he got back to me. He texted me back. He goes, um, don't you have WhatsApp? And I said, I do. And I said, but if somebody wants to send me something on um, that, you know, that app on WhatsApp, I go, they got to tell me. And I said, and how they tell me is that they email me, you mm -hmm. know? And right, I said, right, right. And I go, and I, I said, and my file folders are too big to send them on WhatsApp to them you know, for their symposium. So I go, they're going to have to email me, you know, right. so. I had I'm, the same I, experience in, in May with uh, the Rebuild Festival on regenerative community building. They were doing most of their stuff on WhatsApp. I don't use it. Um, oh, now, so speaking, so now we're a little more present. Let's, um, let's look at the present and the challenges that we're facing on a global scale and, and individually as well. What do you see or, or how can a person better navigate the chaos in order to, to find the embedded order at this point? Because chaos always have an order in it. It's just the ability to stand in the middle of it and find it. Right. right. I would tell people to take a lot of showers. It changes your electron frequency around your body. <laughs> because what, And I say that not just tongue in cheek um, because... Uh, we all know in, in research, water makes a huge difference. Yeah. Water makes a huge difference, you know. So, like, you have an icky day, you know, coming home, you go take a shower and you come out and you're feeling better. It's because, like, and you visualize all that junk going down. There's so much misinformation. There's, mis there's information, misinformation, and disinformation. And so, you have information that comes at you. The question is whether or not is this misinformation or disinformation or just information? It's like liars, damn liars, and statisticians. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, but the thing is that how you can tell the difference is because one's meant to harm you. You know, and you might not know that when you first hear it, but you've got to be able to be open to the frequency of like, does that make sense to me? Mm -hmm. You know, and if something doesn't make sense to me, I open up PubMed, I look at, you know, Lister, I look at um, all these other places for that information to see how many times that keyword comes up in different, you know, journals and things like that. So I can do some research on it. And then, you know, I look at how I disseminate that information. And I always preface this, like, do your own research. Um, and But a lot of people get so bogged down. I mean, you know, I just talked to a, a young woman that I know, and I've known her father for, how old am I? <laughs> for at least like 45 years, something okay. like that. You know, and so she's just, I said, and um, her father keeps on saying, but they said it on the news. You know, and I said to her, I go, when you, next time you go home and she goes, I'm in California, I'm not going back there, <laughs> you know, and she's vivid about it, you know, and I said, tell them to unplug the TV, you know, and I said, because the things that we're getting as information, you got to take a look at who's paying for that information to get to you to begin with. Right. Right. And, 
And, and when you do that, you know, you got to like, you know, you can kind of like, well, wait a minute, this, this is, you know, a lot of this is sticky. It doesn't, it doesn't make, you know, it doesn't make sense. Well, it's you a know? fallacious narrative. And, and, um, you know, the, there was a guy named Howard Bloom that wrote a book called the Lucifer principle. Mm -hmm. And he did a scientific study on how small groups and individuals in history used a narrative that were complete lies or a, that was built on complete lies and eventually made it true because of their access to the media stream mm -hmm. right? or, or whatever that was, whether it was town crier or, you know, um, the gossip in a, a neighborhood before print and, you know, uh, TV and radio and all those right. kinds of things. And, and now all of those media outlets are owned by just a few either individuals or corporations and they're all of the profit over people and, and planet agenda, which mm -hmm. is part of what's being changed in this process and, and it being flipped to people and planet over profit. Now, how that takes place is what's happening as we're speaking. And hopefully we're adding to that uh, shifting thought atmosphere <laughs> because that's their intention to do so. Right, well, you know, a lot of people are very complacent. And um, I noticed that when I lived in DC um, back in 2011 to 2012 or 10 to 12 or th uh, 12, 13, there for two and a half years. And I was so astounded by, and, the, and when I tell people stories about Washington DC, they look at me and they go, you're a conspiracy theorist. I said, <laughs> no, I'm not. I actually live there. And I had connections with doing specific things at a high level. Um, and when I was doing some of those things at that, I, I would just look around. It's like these people, there's nobody home. There's lights on, but nobody's home. And, you know, and there's this like, you know, like, well, because they said this happened, then, then it happened. And I realized, you know, because I didn't drink the water. I always, that was my, I always used to tell people, whatever you do when you go to work, don't drink the water. Because I would see these people who are so excited to be living there and giving something back to the United States of America because they, you know, like they, it was their opportunity. They had this dream and they right. were able to come here and do the dream. Three months later, I'd see them like, hey, how's your job going? Fine. Are you okay? Yeah. Why? You know, it's just like, do you remember meeting me? Yeah. I said, you don't sound excited anymore. I'm excited. <laughs> just, and I would laugh and go, hey, do an experiment. Whatever you do, don't drink the water in the building. I said, go out and get water, bring water in and bring your own food and don't eat in the cafeteria. And I said, because I go, just do it for one month, you know? And I said, and see, I go, if you feel better and I'll check in with you because I go, you're really concerned because you really are like sounding like you're on drugs. Right. Then, well, it's not necessarily the water or the food. Yeah. It's the thought atmosphere that they're constantly surrounded by and the ability that it has to infect how we think and feel if we're not aware or create the safeguards to keep from it. Well, but giving them the, giving them a, a water bottle like mm -hmm. to work from change their focus. Different point of focus. Right. And so, you know, and, but I was, I was always so astounded, like how people, it's like, you've got to be kidding me. And, um, you know, my, I was dating at the time and um, when I was down there, it's just like some of my days were very short lived. I was like, you don't really believe that, do you? Do you, Are you listening to yourself talk? And I'm thinking, I've got to get out of here. And I would just get up and leave. I go, I'm really sorry. I said, you know, I've got to go. And um, and then I would I would just leave. And they're going like, would you want to go out again? No, <laughs> just, no, thank you. Yeah. Um, but you know, the thing about the the um, media is that you know there's a, there's a lot of funding behind it even besides being owned by a certain conglomerate and the funding that's behind it you know you have to look at who's paying for the ads you know and like a lot of the ads that you see are all big pharma ads mm -hmm. you know and big pharma has got an agenda because they don't make any money unless you're sick yeah politics and, yeah. real politics true politics uh, the politica Right, mm -hmm. the, the Aristotle brought forth long ago is isn't isn't even present today. It's the corporate line, mm -hmm. and because they're influencing everything because of the money, and it is so challenging for people to refuse money because of what it can do. 
that it's diminished our capacity to perform as a collective and that in my opinion is what's being made visible to everyone at this point globally for those who are willing to see it anyway and it's bringing people like you and i together to talk about creating a new normal in a different way that's advantageous to humanity instead of diminishing or destructive oh for sure you know and you know there's a reason for everything right mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know and that that mental cleansing because we've been so conditioned to you know um to like to like hear see feel like media information um that you know we forget how to think it's just like you know it's like somebody already does it for you it's like the george jetson you know mm -hmm. his, his boy elroy i mean everything that was in that cartoon right has mm -hmm. happened you know, it's just like, you know, t telephones that people talk on, you know, and, yeah. you know, and they're, you know, have even like, you know, made cars that can fly, you know, YouTube, you know, and around, you know, and things like, you know, you pop something into the oven and it pops right back out like the microwave. I mean, everything on that cartoon, you know, has, you know, been manifested. And um, if you, if you don't know who that cartoon is, go look up on YouTube. Um, and, and meet George right. Jetson, his boy Elroy, Jane, his wife. <laughs> you know, there was there were things that were that we we're exposed to. You know, constantly we're barraged by information and energy and molecules. Everything is frequency. And when people say like, "Oh, that can't be," well, every molecule in your body has a certain charge to it. Yeah, you can't think, your, or can't think your way through a. a universe built on vibration you have to feel your way through it and, that, yep. and we're not used to that because we've been told you know guys especially last century can't express your emotions you've got mm -hmm. to be stalwart you've got to be the epitome of the the stalwart person in your community or, or your family or whatever don't ever talk about things that matter truly on an emotional level you know right. just do the details and go to work pay your bills you know, let mom write, raise the kids and all that has completely shifted today. Yeah. Um, and so, almost, to the, almost to the other extreme, that it's, it's an extreme, you know, that you're well, having yeah, the, the so much visceral reaction to things that it's like, it's like oh, so well over the top that there's like, you know, you've got to come back over here. The balance is here. Mm -hmm. You know, the balance isn't over there. On an, you know, so, if you've ever been a teeter totter, you know that. Absolutely. So acknowledging the teeter-totter, and we spoke earlier about the seesaw with the, the different chemistry in the brain and, and how to activate that. What could you give uh, as far as practical advice? Uh, and I, I know I asked this before, but in, this is in a different way, uh, as to recognize and manage and, and maybe even be um, resilient toward the barrage of things that are attempting to keep us uh, fearful and afraid of each other and separative well i think you have to start with the basic thing because you need your health for everything so you've got to fix your health if there's an issue with the health you got to fix it and so if it's whether it's you're not thinking well you're not moving well you're not feeling well you got to figure out where that glitch is at and you got to figure out how to put not just a band-aid on it, but you've got to actually you know like be able to move forward mm -hmm. you know you can't and, run a marathon and ask for help Right. And ask for help. Right. It's okay to ask for help. People have a problem asking for help, you know, and just saying, you know, I don't know how to do this. Well, great. Somebody does. So if you ask me a question, I don't know the answer. You know, someone does. I'll find somebody for you who does, mm -hmm. you know. And so by piecing those pieces of the puzzle together, it recreates a foundation because structure is function. Everything has to have some foundational aspect to it in order to have something to stand on whatever it is yeah. whatever person it is you gotta eat, you gotta stand for something or you fall for anything well you either you, you use your voice you know you're vocal and you're valuable and but but as far as the the health part the health has got to come really first why and it's just like so if there's a glitch someplace that you haven't paid attention to you've got to figure out like you know what is it that i can do you know that i can get past that or i can manage it better why I'm doing, like, why I'm having this other relevation and other things going on around me so mm -hmm. I can move forward. 
because you don't want to move backwards. And when you do move forward, and we do have that healing moment, you know, whatever it is, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, or socially, then what you can do is like you're in your community. So those behind you, those in front of you, and those around you get to have the benefit of that breakthrough that you're having, because it's molecular and it, 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 everything is energy, you know, so if you heal yourself, then you heal you know, everybody around you in the communities and communities. So, and then it's having that, you know, that level of consciousness, I mean, come up. I mean, when you talk about, you know, even like, you know, some changes in consciousness in the last like 20 years, you know, if you ever, you know, talk about like, oh, we'd be talking on Zoom, you know, in recording, you know, and we was like, that's never going to happen, <laughs> you know? And then they started with FaceTime, you know, and then Everybody wanted to have face and they wanted to see their grandkids who lived like, you know, 2000 miles away, you know, and be able to at least have a, a moment that you could see that, you know, and in the such. So it's just like, you have to have the, you have to look at the pieces of the puzzle and how they're working for you. And if you can't figure out where the breaks at, then you've got to hire somebody because there is not, you know, there's no process that doesn't require really time and you don't want to wait until you have a crisis or a bigger problem when you can handle it, when it just might've been just a Band-Aid that you needed as opposed yeah, to surgery. Absolutely. Right. Well, Dr. Pat, this has been a very healthy conversation, <laughs> hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's, it's, it's fun. I mean, it's just like you, you know, I love conversations like this because you know, there's such a, you know, there's no, first off, I love things that are no rules. I'm a nonconformist, um, and, you know, but I like seeing things, you know, like I love seeing how other people think about the same things, you know, and looking at, you know, how do you collaborate? Because we have to collaborate today. We got, we got to have our collective souls who are out there who, you know, want to move forward, you know, and they have forward thinking, you know, and they're not stuck, you know, right. it's just like, as if you're stuck, then, and you can't move forward, then you can't do something quicker, faster, and better. Well, you're you know? describing most of my, uh, if not all of my guests in some way, shape, or form, <laughs> and for that purpose, so that we, you know, can learn how we're all speaking the same thing differently, and that alone helps us unify uh, to some degree in order to move forward, collaborate better. Well, how I, what I say is the other day, I, um, somebody asked me about something and I said, well, I don't offer just solutions. I offer solutions, mm. you know, and when I offer those solutions, I walk with you. Right. And we walk with each other always, yeah. whether we realize it or not. Well, yeah. Pat, thanks again for your time. It's been a wonderful conversation. I, and I, I know our audience is going to benefit from the various key points and, and discussions and even maybe new things that, uh, again, kind of an apocalyptic moment. For, <laughs> you know, right. Or it's just like, let's go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, super. Thanks so much again. And namaste and in la catch. Thank you so much for enjoying this edition of an episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>